Hello. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm Alyssa Black, the director of New America's California Civic Innovation Project. I'm usually out on the West Coast exploring ways that municipalities in California can innovate with technology, new programs, and policies. So it's really nice to be here with you in New America's DC offices this afternoon. Um, over the next two hours, uh, through some shared stories um, by our panelists and participation from the audience, you will be participating, and from Twitter. Um, I hope to illustrate civic innovation um, in practice as a way of framing its meaning, exploring its limitations, and better understanding the potential impact the, um, in the way that we interact with each other and with government. Civic innovation really is a buzzword right now. I realize that. Um, and, and to broaden our understanding at the California Civic Innovation Project, we interviewed 20 practitioners in the field, kind of people that we identified that work within that system. And through those interviews and through our research, we really started thinking about civic innovation less as a thing or a concept and more as an ecosystem. So I'll kind of refer to it throughout the evening, or the afternoon, as an ecosystem. It's really more than just, and it's an ecosystem, sorry, I should include, that we really think about is made up of government, civic groups, residents, foundations, academics, and civic hackers. Um, it's more than really just a compilation of projects. It can be a process as well, which can inspire institutional change. This really is an important point to consider because the spread of civic innovation throughout communities and government will require a culture shift that reframes our current processes. So for example, leadership that encourages experimentation or allows for some risk taking or um, allows for a space for ideas to germinate within the system can really be helpful and, and important in spreading a culture of innovation in a large organization like government. So we'll hear from some of our speakers today about how the, that shift in government is happening and whether it's enough to save our democracy. In the work that I focus on at the California Civic Innovation Project, I often think about, I, I think about the local level municipal government and really think about how that's central to civic innovation, but I realize that that's not the complete story. Um, we have at least two speakers with us today that will share stories where government is not central. And I asked this panel of wonderful women to join me today, one, because they're awesome, and two, because they'll share their unique perspectives and maybe tell stories that broaden your concept of civic innovation and what you're defining um, as civic innovation. The goal really should not be to develop a single kind of coherent, consistent definition of civic innovation, so much as it should be to understand the different models and how they might engage one another and the types of investments that are needed to promote institutional change. So this event really is just the beginning of a series of conversations about civic innovation where we can continue to talk about what it means, the potential impact, its ability to have sustaining impact and long-term change, and ultimately continually redefine the field. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. And for those of you that are viewing via live stream, you can use the civic innovation hashtag and we will um, answer some of your questions towards the end of the event. And when we do our next activity, you can also participate using that hashtag. Um, so before we get to the speakers, I thought that we would start with a short interactive activity um, to get you guys thinking about how you define civic innovation for yourselves. And so I'll first explain the activity, and then I'll demo it with my colleagues, and then you'll get off your feet and participate. We'll spend about 15 minutes actually doing this exercise, and then we'll get back and listen to our panelists. Um, so it's called a spectrogram. And basically, what I'm going to do is make a polarizing statement about civic innovation to get you thinking about it. And on one side of the room, we'll do totally disagree. So back by the beverages, that's a totally disagree. And up here is totally agree. And so I'll make a statement, and you line yourself up along this imaginary line down the aisle as to where, how much you agree or disagree to the statement that I make. And then I'll go and ask a few of you, via one sentence, kind of why you stood in that place so that you can defend your position. And, it's, and if we had more time, what we would do is kind of listen to each other and kind of hear each other's positions and why you're standing in that place and maybe even move as we hear each other talk about what civic innovation is to them. We won't have time for that today. So just stand in your spot um, and kind of I'll come to you with the microphone and you can tell me why you chose that spot. Um, so I'll demo with my colleagues right now and then we'll go ahead and do it. 
this is totally disagree. Down here, Bowtie and Kirsten. And this is totally agree. And this is Georgia, and this is Preston. Um, so my polarizing statement for this activity is that DC weather rocks today, especially. <laughs> DC weather rocks is awesome. This is the example. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so Georgia, you're over here. Yep, we have a mic. <laughs> Thank you. So why are you in totally disagree? I mean, no, agree. agree. Uh, so naturally, I operate very warm. So cold weather is perfect, because it means that I'm not really sweaty all over the place everywhere we go. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Georgia. And Preston, why are you all the way over here? Well, I'm, I'm from Alabama, where it's oftentimes really warm and it's like Ronnie Van Zant from Leonard Skinner said you can take a boy out of Dixieland but you can't take Dixie out the boy you know <laughs> thank you so okay if everybody will stand up I'll make my statement and then again this is totally agree and totally disagree and you don't have to be at the polar ends you can be somewhere in the middle so the first statement is that technology is central to civic innovation so technology is central to civic innovation. This is agree at the, at the podium stage and disagree at the beverages. Yeah, again, the, the statement is technology is central to civic innovation. Okay, I'm going to go on the, on the extremes first, and you totally agree over here. Why do you totally agree? One sentence, because I'm going to get a lot of people. Well, I think that civic innovation in terms of its impact on technology is critical for communities to get together to come up with new ideas of transformation of communities. Great, thank you. OK, somebody that's a little bit, well, is in the middle. Let's go with you. Um, so technology is obviously very important, but if you don't understand the community that you're working within or the government that you're working with, you can't really use that technology. Great. OK, we're moving down towards disagree. Why, you, why do you disagree? Or kind of in the middle, kind of little, in the leaning middle. towards disagree. Well, just to build off of what she said uh, just a moment ago, I think that context is really important. And sometimes technology inhibits some of the context that we have with face-to-face. -face. <laughs> Great. OK, I'm going to get a totally disagree. And then we'll move on to the next statement. Contrary to popular opinion, technology in and of itself is never central to a major decision. It will always be shaped primarily by the political will. Great. OK, ready to get moving? The next question is, again, agree at the stage, disagree at the beverages. Civic innovation can save our democracy. <laughs> That's agree at the stage. Disagree down here. Civic innovation. Civic innovation. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm coming in behind you. <laughs> okay, middle person. I think it can um, contribute to improving our democracy. Um, it's not the total solution, but um, I think it will have a positive effect. Great. And from our panelists, Rachel? I think that oftentimes municipalities have a lot more flexibility to experiment and uh, hopefully provide some, um, some scalable ways that, uh, to, to address larger, more systemic issues. Yep, great. Okay, I'm going to get a totally agree. I think uh, it's the main thing moving us forward, and I'm glad to hear about it today. Great. <laughs> Okay, the last statement that we'll do is um, the Occupy movement is a form of civic innovation. This is to test how you're defining it for yourself. Civic 
So this is agree? Okay. Agree and disagree at the beverages. Can I ask you where you would stand on the spectrum? I'm kind of out of it. I don't want to bore you. Okay. I don't have an opinion. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, let me go down to totally disagree that the Occupy movement is a form of civic innovation. Lorelai. Oh, dear. Um, I think the, the, uh, the gap between their revolution and our governing institutions was never uh, adequately filled and therefore um, won't have a long-term impact unless that changes. Okay, I'm going to move to the middle ground. Let's get you, sir. Well, I uh, think that the Occupy movement was a positive contribution in raising an issue, but fell far short of a way to actually engage the larger public in the issue. Great, thank you. Okay, moving along. And you, you're kind of moving towards agree, you're leaning on agree, you're in, I'm, okay, I'm you're in agree. agree. Okay. Uh, I just couldn't get far enough. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think it was an important innovation. I think it called attention to a major problem. Um, I agree with my colleague, who happens to be my husband. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, it, that, that was not planned. <laughs> that uh, it didn't have as much lasting power as it might have, and if it had a way to get legs, we'd see more from it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'm all the way with the agree. Scotty? Um, I don't think that you can say that something isn't an innovation just because it didn't work or didn't have a lasting impact. I think that, uh, in fact, that's one of the natures of innovations is that many of them are going to fail at least to do what they initially set out to do. But I think that it was innovative is pretty indisputable. Yep, great. Okay, I lied last time, we have time for one more. Um, so, the last one is, there is no civic innovation without government. There is no civic innovation without government. This is agree, and that's disagree by the beverages. You're just going to stay put over here. <laughs> You're very agreeable. <laughs> I want you on my team. <laughs> Okay, the, the statement again is there's no civic innovation without government. Okay, I'm going to stay down here with the agrees since I'm closer here. Well, it's probably actually not true, but I had to, <laughs> someone had to stay down here. And I think to build off the Occupy point, if you don't have government buy-in, you're inevitably a voluntary movement, and that's not going to last because people won't volunteer forever. So you need government to institutionalize innovation. Okay, I'm going to move along here. Here, you're almost in the, I don't know, but you're towards agree. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, for me, civic innovation occurs in the context of the civitas, of the ordered society. Um, and in order to have that kind of structure, you need a structure to work with. Great, thank you. I'm just moving along the spectrum now. Yeah, I, I think that's a civic innovation, or the government plays more of a role of um, providing a structure and, you know, allows for, for people to participate. Um, but I don't, I think it's more of a tool rather than a means. Great, thank you. Okay. Let's go here. All right. Well, uh, Towards disagree or in disagree. Um, as we saw with Occupy, you had a group of people engaging with their world and their society and it didn't necessarily co coincide with what the government was doing. So I think people are finding their own ways. I'm not advocating for anarchy, but it doesn't necessarily have to, it's not really happening within our government now. It's coming from people. Great. I'll get another disagree. Uh, hard to repeat, uh, I agree with what she said. Yeah, a plus, a plus one, okay, back here. Um, revolution was the greatest technology and civic innovation in history, and I, I think that was not a government tool. Great. Thank you all for thank you all for joining in the activity. Um, what we'll do is, if you get seated again, I'll introduce the panelists, and we'll hear from the panelists for a little bit, and then we'll do a moderate Q and A. Yeah.
Can I leave this with you? It's going to go to Elliot eventually, but I'll okay. We do a lot of this. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, it's called a spectrogram, a facilitator that I've used quite often. Um, he works in between the tech policy field. His name is Gunner. Um, he's done that with the groups that I've worked with before, and it's a really fun exercise. So I thought it would get us. Excuse me? In what sense is it interactive? You guys are interacting Wait. with each other. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and so uh, what we're going to do now is go into the panel stage where we'll hear from our panelists and then I'll do a moderated Q&A with them and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from Twitter and from, from you. Um, so starting on your left, uh, we have Rachel Black. She's a senior policy analyst in the Asset Building Program at the New America Foundation where she provides research, analysis, and public commentary on federal policies to increase savings among low-income and moderate-income households. And her specific areas of focus include reform of asset limits in public assistance programs, expanding access to college savings, and initiatives to increase savings at tax time. Moving along, we have Kathy Pettit, is the Senior Research Associate at the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute, whose research focuses on measuring and understanding housing markets and neighborhood change. She's also an expert on local and national data systems useful in housing and urban development research and program development. She directs the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is a collaborative effort of the Urban Institute and local partners in 37 cities who help communities use neighborhood level data in policymaking and organizing. And she's currently working on a project to explore the intersection of open data with other community information and action groups and an edited volume with the Federal Reserve of San Francisco on the use of data in community development. And then we're moving on to Hillary. She's a Presidential Innovation Fellow working with My USA Project at the General Services Administration. Hillary has been working to make government more accessible and available online for 15 years, starting as a web designer for Arkansas.gov in 1997. In her most recent role as Director of Integrated Marketing for an e-government provider, NIC, Hillary helped NIC's 29 state portals embrace new technology and concepts for 21st century government. She speaks at events across the country, educating and evangelizing Gov2.0 and social networking best practices for government. Then we have Michelle Koth, is a lawyer by day and a civic hacker by night. As the Code for America Brigade co-captain and core developer on several open source web applications for local government, in 2011, Michelle was an inaugural Code for America Fellow, which ignited her passion for local civic web development. And prior to Code for America, Michelle worked as a patent attorney for a private law firm and as a web application developer and server administrator for a global health corporation. And then we have Ryan Garrity. She's a computer scientist turned social scientist. Ryan has worked at the intersection of communities and technologists domestically and internationally. She's a senior field analyst at the Open Technology Institute and works internationally on community technology projects. Most recently, she traveled to Tunisia with the team to help launch a community wireless network. And during the beginning of the Syrian uprising, she lived in Damascus and worked with human rights monitors and nonviolent activists. In the U.S., she's worked for Social Compact on developing alternative neighborhood indicators that would counterbalance the traditional market indicators that discriminate against underserved inner city neighborhoods. So you can tell we have a broad range of women and stories that they're going to share. So I've asked each one to maybe share with you a story about civic innovation so you can get an idea of what it is in practice. And we'll start with Rachel and then move through and then we'll go into a moderated Q&A. Great. Thanks, Alyssa, and thanks for inviting me to be here and talk about civic innovation through the context of our experience partnering with the City of New York on their pilot Save NYC, uh, which was intended to connect low-income uh, residents of New York with opportunities to save at tax time. And I think this is a really great example of how cities, in partnership with think tanks like ours, can use some of the innovative strategies that they're using to address local problems as an evidence base to inform the development of, uh, of federal policy. So I'll start by talking a little bit about what brought each of us to the issue of savings at tax time and describe the Save NYC pilot itself. 
and then talk a little bit about how uh, each of us are leveraging that experience to move uh, further towards advancing this larger federal policy goal. So to start out, uh, let me give you a little background on the asset building program and why we focus on savings. Um, our basic, uh, our, our operating principle at the asset building program is that uh, a little bit of savings at the right time can make a big difference. And uh, using the savings, uh, especially among low income families, can not only help reduce poverty, but over time can also help increase economic mobility. And if you think about it, um, when your car breaks down or when you have an unexpected medical expense, you know, most of us feel fairly confident and secure knowing that we have the money in the bank to cover it. But low-income families have very thin financial margins. So when these kinds of events occur, uh, oftentimes it uh, creates these uh, very undesirable trade-offs. Either you have to forego something that you need immediately, like paying your rent or meeting your utility bill, or it means that you have to find uh, some other resources to cover it. Um, and oftentimes this means uh, seeking out some kind of alternative uh, financial product, like a payday, lo payday loan, which can be incredibly expensive. So this is why we focus on building opportunities for low-income families to connect to basic savings products. Um, the U.S. also agrees that saving is an important goal, and we invest about uh, half a trillion dollars each year, uh, primarily through the tax code, on helping Americans save, uh, but there are a couple problems with this approach. The first is that, um, for the most part, the beneficiaries of this policy are already wealthy. They're already high-income, high-wealth individuals. Um, think of things like the home mortgage interest deduction or exclusions uh, for retirement savings. Um, so not only do uh, these resources not get to low-income families, but the activities that are supported um, really don't have anything to do with that very basic emergency savings need. So it's with these considerations in mind that um, we tried to think of a way to help uh, connect low-income families to uh, just really some of these really basic flexible resources. And even though the tax code itself doesn't help meet these needs, the tax filing process is actually a, a process, is a platform that engages uh, at least 26 million uh, low-income households every year um, who are trying to access the earned income tax credit. And this is the largest anti-poverty program which uh, for working families, it basically functions as a, a wage supplement. And uh, for a lot of these families, this can be the largest check that they get all year. So um, something that we think of when we're trying to craft policy uh, is, uh, is really sort of modeled on uh, the if you build it, they will come principle, right? Most of us aren't inherent savers. Most of us aren't necessarily inherent anything. Um, but for instance, uh, if you're in a room with a donut, you're much more likely to eat that donut, right? If a donut is not in front of you, you are much less likely to actually eat that donut. And this is very much how savings occurs. You know, if you work for an organization that offers you a 401k, you're much more likely to save, especially since um, there's typically some kind of match associated with it. So these are some of the ideas that we apply uh, to this policy that we developed. Uh, called, or originally called the Savers Bonus, um, which allows uh, a, a low-income family through the tax filing process to be able to just sort of check a box uh, if they want to uh, direct a portion of their savings into, uh, or a portion of their refund into savings. If they don't already have an account, they can actually do it directly on the tax form. So it's integrated, it's easy, and it's also valuable. Um, the credit would match their savings uh, for 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, so that's hopefully enough to give a little nudge to the families for whom uh, departing with these uh, resources can be very challenging. Uh, this turned into, uh, it took a legislative uh, form in 2008 when Senator uh, Robert Menendez from New Jersey introduced it for the first time as, this, uh, as the Savers Bonus Act. Um, and it was really around the same time that the city of New York was uh, establishing their Office of Financial Empowerment. And uh, this was 
uh, in response to, or with a mandate to respond to some of the challenges that the, their Department of Consumer Affairs was, uh, was sort of seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And something that they were frequently observing was that uh, struggling families would come in and um, would be in some of the situations that I described earlier. I mean, they'd be falling short on their rent, um, they'd be missing utility payments, they would have high levels of debt, high levels of very costly debt. Um, and uh, they're sort of charged with seeking out some innovative strategies to help these households. So it was sort of in, in their process of, uh, of consultation um, that they arrived at this idea um, of, of the savers bonus and uh, launched uh, their, their pilot in 2008 called Save NYC, which was very much uh, the savers bonus in in action, and um, and that was that was by design. It was uniquely it was their assessment that the solution to the problems that they were observing um, were accomplished through a federal policy. They certainly understood their limitation their limitations as a municipality and um, providing both the scale and the depths of the resources that was necessary to meet this need on an ongoing basis. They thought that the lack of emergency savings that families had was a function of a deficit uh, on federal policy. So they very much saw it. Um, they saw their role as a city to be able to sort of affirm this proof of concept. and. Um, for them to do that, they thought it was really central to uh, satisfy two basic research questions. One, would low-income families save? And two, would it, would it matter? Um, even if they were able to save, were they shifting money away from more immediate essential needs? Um, were they able to even maintain those savings um, for the en entirety of the program? Um, very much sort of in dispute. I mean, even within communities that fully subscribe to the idea that savings are important are really uh, whether or not low-income families should be saving to begin with. Don't they have more immediate needs that they should be addressing? So is this a worthwhile policy goal? So these were some of the ideas that um, the Save NYC pilot uh, was designed to assess. So in 2008, um, the pilot was launched and administered through their system of volunteer income tax assistance sites and it went basically something like this you know if you showed up to uh, file your taxes at one of these centers um, the person who was filing your taxes would ask you if you'd like to uh, set aside a portion of your savings or of your, of your refund to save if yes they would set up uh, the account on the spot uh, if you made uh, a deposit over over their basic threshold, um, and you maintain that amount for a year, that would be matched 50 cents on the dollar. Um, it was intended to be a very easy, streamlined process. Um, so at the end of the three-year pilot, uh, I think it's safe to say that it was, it was successful. Both of those questions were answered in the affirmative. Um, so there are about uh, two, a little over 2,000 accounts uh, total set up. Um, it sounds like a very small amount of money, uh, or, or a small number of accounts considering the population of New York, <laughs> but uh, it, it's important to say that this was all a uh, privately uh, funded endeavor and that you know, the monies that were set aside by the foundations uh, for this program were exhausted almost immediately. So there was demand far in excess of what the actual take up ended up being. Um, so there are 2,000 people who opened accounts. Um, they saved on average a little less than $600. And keep in mind, this is probably, if the average refund for households in this income bracket are a little over $2,000, this is a very substantial portion. Uh, of their tax refund. Um, and the average income of the families who were participating was around $18,000. And this isn't just uh, middle America $18,000. This is New York City $18,000. So uh, I think it, it really speaks to um, the importance that the families placed uh, on participating uh, in, in this program. Um, 
And not only that, uh, about 90% of the families were able to maintain uh, their deposits through the entirety of the year. Um, not only that, but a lot continued to uh, participate in the program, maintain their, their accounts even after the conclusion of that first required savings year. Um, and s surveys uh, conducted afterwards indicate that families who did participate uh, were much better off than uh, the people who didn't end up participating. They were uh, much less likely to be in debt. In fact, they were much more likely to be paying off their debt. Um, they felt more confident about their financial futures, um, feeling like if something bad happened, they would be able to respond. And that helped them think uh, much more uh, in a long-term context, planning for the future instead of just trying to get from one day to the next. And this, I mean, psychologically has a big, has a big impact. Um, so all this we would, I, I think we would stick our flag in and uh, incite as a success. Um, so at the end of the three years, the city of New York was heavily invested in uh, sort of spreading the gospel of this to, to other cities. Um, they thought it was really important to make sure that um, it was possible to replicate the results that they were seeing in New York outside of the city in order to, to expand the base um, of, of, uh, of, of, of evidence and of data um, to help support um, the advancement of sort of the, of the federal policy objective. So um, Save NYC turned into Save USA through funding through the Social Innovation Fund at the Corporation for uh, National and Community Service. Uh, so it's currently in New York as its original, as its original city, as well as um, Tulsa and San Antonio and Newark. And uh, the, the program has been funded through at least the next couple of years. Um, ideally, though, uh, as I said on the onset, it has always been the objective to have this um, to have this program reach scale through a national policy, and to that end, uh, this is something that we have been working on uh, communicating the results of Save NYC to demonstrate that this is successful, not only in concept, but in practice, and educating policymakers on, on its potential. Um, and last July, um, Representative Jose Serrano of New York uh, introduced a uh, revamped and refreshed version now called the Financial Security Credit. Um, and right now we're working on um, on introduction on a Senate companion bill. So I, I think for us, uh, this really has all the markers of being a very successful collaboration, something that has, has allowed us to have uh, validation for uh, an idea uh, that we've developed and something that has given uh, the city of New York in this instance, you know, a platform to be able to elevate uh, the work that they're doing um, and see it potentially um, take shape on a national on a national level. Thank you, Rachel. And we can move on to Kathy. Um, go ahead. Let's get started. Great, thanks. Um, it's great to start with a policy innovation. I was, um, I was said I was the, I was told I was the skeptic on the panel, but I think everybody's <laughs> pretty much on the same page. It sounds like, but um, you know, when they asked me what civic innovation was, I paused for a second, trying to think, and I think. You know, the innovation is really a break. It's not an incremental change. It's doing something really different. And the civic means towards a public good. So I was, um, I gave some examples of, uh, from my experience, um, what that means. And the technology, I think, comes to mind first and is uh, sort of the sexy part of it. But, and others can speak about that too and during the questions. But I, people can innovate through different means and policy is one of them. The work that we do, um, really focuses around institutional innovation. And in the, as one example, in the mid-90s, um, some community groups that had been working against persistent poverty started to assemble local administrative data, which was quite a chore at that point, um, uh, vital stats, crime, education, health, um, and really um, work with the low-income residents and organizations in those neighborhoods to what does this mean um, for directions? Is this right? What are we missing? Um, and not only did they find that having this really geographically specific information result in better decisions, 
but it actually gave the organizations and residents a new place at the table. It gave them um, some voice and some power in what was happening in their neighborhoods. They were really excited about this, and the, um, they, the innovation was that they decided as organizations, some universities, some foundations, but that actually assembling and sharing this neighborhood level information would be a part of their core mission and part of their mission um, around social equity. So the, I think the, the innovation could not have been possible without technology. So GIS was just um, invented at that point. Uh, personal computing was becoming more common. So we needed the tech um, and the tech in the government to automate the records. But without the decision by the institutions to actually take this on, nothing would have happened. And I think um, more recent examples have been playing this role between um, technologists and the civic world. And um, the Smart Chicago Collaborative is one example um, that's trying to bridge this gap. Um, uh, our partner in Minneapolis just announced Cura Tech, um, which is a McKnight Foundation funded project to organize, um, to organize the neighborhood um, folks and organize the civic developers and um, play as a broker, as a translator, I think, for them. So these organizations are really important without any technological um, improvements. So I think the, um, I have an example to show rather than talk more conceptually, and I think you might have heard about it recently because the Camden Coalition for Healthcare Providers won a Knight Foundation grant a couple weeks ago for their work. And it started um, more than a decade ago um, with a uh, real innovator, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner. And he was a physician that started to look at health hospital records to map out violence in the city. So not just crime, but what are the gunshot wounds and looking at data, different data sets together. And started to talk to other primary care providers about how difficult it was to serve the Camden folks. And so he began this, um, this coalition that began at the same time there are three hospitals in Camden, which is quite a lot for a small city. Um, and they were getting worried about the rising cost of caring for the uninsured and really um, hadn't been using their data well to understand who they were serving. So the three hospitals agreed to share their data, not with each other because they were competitors, but with a neutral party, which at that time was our partner CamConnect um, and the Camden Coalition working together. So the um, this hospitalization data had address, um, what the diagnosis code was, um, the um, age, demographics. Um, and so for the first time, the hospitals could see that they were serving the same patients. Um, they could also see that it was they were touching um, half the population in Camden had actually been to the emergency room or to a hosp the hospital in that past year. So it was a really, they were having a huge impact and there was a lot of money being wasted. They did maps um, by block about uh, folks with chronic disease like diabetes or preventable incidents like falls of elderly folks um, uh, to try to just see what was happening in the city. And what this led to was both a community level intervention and an individual level intervention. And at the community level, they um, looked at where the diabetes prevalence was and a foundation um, they had 7,000 individuals that had come to the hospital for diabetes over a six-year period, charging over $1 billion in medical charges. So a, a foundation stepped forward and funded the um, citywide, citywide Diabetes Collaborative, which created some courses about how to better manage the disease to avoid hospitalization before it got to a crisis point. And what these maps did was show them where the people were, they, where they needed to do outreach. So instead of doing some bus ad everywhere or general radio spots, they actually knew where they were, um, uh, they knew where their focus was and could um, put more energy into the, into the courses and into the education than in, into um, sort of generic advertising. And on the individual level, which I think is more popular, the New Yorker article calls it the hot spotters. It identified um, individuals that ha were super utilizers. So depending the, the number of changes, what number, I mean, depending on what article you read, but you know, 20% of the visitors generated 90% of the visits or costs that were there. So what Dr. Brenner thought is that this is really a failure of healthcare system. This is not, um, and it wasn't about money really, it was about sort of how do you get better, uh, you know, better health outcomes for people because these emergency room visits weren't doing it. So they both did home visits. So they figured out sort of what is the environment, the social, the um, uh, 
family issues around um, causing these health, around the um, health concerns of the individual, and they gave them an individual um, nurse practitioner's number. So they had a contact, somebody they knew and trusted to go to for medical advice. And within a short amount of time, they drastically reduced the hospital visits and made really huge progress. The, I mean, the coalition has advanced then. So that was, you know, five years ago, five plus years ago. They now have real-time data. They're adding in new data sources. They're expanding to other places. But I think that the lesson is that the community improvement required, one, the creation of this neutral home where the um, uh, primary care providers and the hospitals could come together, um, a safe comp place where confidential data could be protected, um, but the insights could be shared with the public. It also um, created new data, obviously. These um, shared data sets with hospitals sharing data showed them patterns that they wouldn't have been able to see um, elsewhere. Um, and then it, it really required these primary service providers in the hospitals taking a huge risk and doing something different, a really innovative practice that um, I think was uncomfortable for everybody involved. So the coalition is now working with a network of cities trying to s replicate this model, some with federal funding, some with philanthropy. And the Knight Grant, um, when I spoke with them last week, um, they're very excited about really pushing this more out to the public. So what the Knight Grant will do is allow them to create an open source portal so that um, different communities can load their own data in and use the analytic tools that they've um, used. But you know, I think the technology will be fantastic and it will lower barriers, but it will only work in communities where they're willing, um, where there's an institution willing to pull this together and where there's um, folks that are willing to actually change their practice. So I'm happy to share other examples from NNIP during the um, conversation, but I um, will um, end with that. Thank you, Kathy. Hi there. Thanks, Alyssa, for the invitation. Um, just as a recap, I'm Hillary Hartley. I um, am currently a Presidential Innovation Fellow and uh, was formerly with a company called NIC, which is egov.com. And I just want to uh, wake everybody up for a second, but also just say, like, ask a few questions. Um, I'm curious, uh, who has ever renewed your driver's license online? Can you raise your hand? All right. Who's like paid uh, income tax or property taxes online? Who has um, uh, checked into Foursquare at their polling place location? I knew there'd be a few. <laughs> um, you know, these are all examples of civic innovations. Um, who's been to a hackathon, civic related or maybe otherwise? Uh, so, so uh, you know, a lot of us in this room are are are, are um, participating in various ways. Um, and I think my spot on the panel is pretty much to uh, address the woman at the beginning who said, that's not happening in our government. Um, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely is. And uh, maybe it's in ways that uh, are not quite as visible. Um, and maybe in ways that uh, we take for granted now in 2014. It sounds weird to even say that, 2014. Um, but, uh, so NIC has been around for 20 plus years. Uh, they got started as a, as a text-only bulletin board system 22 years ago doing DMV stuff. And uh, it kind of grew into the web. Nebraska, of all states, was the very first website to go uh, to make the move uh, to HTML and to s embrace the web and to put their their content and their services online. Uh, way to go, Nebraska.gov, um, and NIC State. Um, but uh, you know, so this is this has been uh, happening and percolating for a very long time. And again, I think we take a lot of it for granted now. Um, and we just expect, well, why can't I go to the website and get a hunting or fishing <laughs> license online? And why can't I go and immediately see my, uh, you know, the, the alternate side of the street parking? Like, that should be easy to find. And congratu congratulations to NYC.gov for doing that recently. Um, their redesign it addressed a lot of these little simple things that I think a lot of us just expect now. Um, and uh, Steve Ressler, as many of us think of Mr. GovLoop, the, the founder of GovLoop, you know, he told me, uh, a while ago, he said, you know, NIC is such a cool story because they really are the very first civic startup. You know, they started doing this and they're around. So there is a model for sustainability and there is a model for, m for making money even. And I think that that is really one of the things that uh, with my, I am a federal employee right now, but with my, my government hat off, I mean, that's one of the things that I see as the biggest um, 
the biggest things that we need to tackle kind of as a community really is empowering the, co the, the, uh, the really cool projects that come out of Code for America and that come out of the brigades and to help these people uh, that, are, that are pouring their souls into maybe these, these, these little software widgets or this, this, this little thing is to figure out how to empower them uh, and help them you know, make these projects sustainable, uh, repeatable, um, again, you know, Code for America and the Brigade and uh, everything that they're trying to do is really a a addressing that on some level, uh, the repeat repeatability and getting it in your city. But I, I do think that there's some foundational elements missing, and that's that's part of the story that's really intriguing to me. Um, but so now, kind of going back and putting my my federal employee hat on. Um, at NIC, you know, we, we operate as a vendor, but it is, it is a public-private partnership. It, it was possibly the very first public-private partnership. And, um, and that, you know, is one of these models, I think, that can push that sustainable thing forward. Um, but it also is coming from within. So things like the Presidential Innovation Fellows, things like um, the HHS Innovation Fellows, even Code for America, you know, they get embedded uh, for a month and then they're working with, with locals and now states. Um, and as Alyssa alluded to at the beginning, I think that one of the fundamental things that happens with fellowships like those um, is that culture change element. Uh, you know, the, the thing that, that is half of, if not more, of my job as a fellow working inside the federal government and with the General Services Administration is, is to, to kind of figure out where we can push buttons and where we can uh, kind of cut some red tape and what bureaucracy we can cut through or maybe root around. Um, and and I, you know, I say that very specifically, you know, absolutely. Um, because there, there are ways to get things done um, that are you know, still completely uh, fulfilling all of, the, all of the requirements that we need to do to get something live. Um, that's not to say there's not bureaucracy, but I, I do think that, that the energy that, that things like fellowships can bring into, uh, into the culture and into the, into the government, be it federal, state, or local, uh, that really is that, that, uh, that spark that it can ignite and catalyze and, uh, and lead to change that lasts beyond my fellowship or beyond my six to 12 month tenure that, that gets the other people there that might be you know, the, career, uh, the career people that I'm working with and working side by side with to say, wow, we can keep this going and we can, you know, we can really kind of keep these, keep these gears going. Um, so just very quickly uh, about My USA. So I'm, the project that I got assigned as a fellow is called My USA. You can go to myusa.gov and sign up for um, an announcement of when we go live. It's in super, super alpha mode right now, which means if you have a .gov address, uh, you can sign up and kind of immediately start playing around with it. But if you don't, uh, you have to wait until we open the floodgates in a couple of months. Um, but uh, so to kind of go back to something that I, I almost even cringe now when I say it because it's been said so much, but it really is true that sort of government 2.0 as uh, you know, uh, the, the, the platform, you know, government as a platform. And to me, my USA is kind of that platform. So that's what's been really exciting for me is, is we're working on kind of almost platform as a service, software as a service, uh, a, a platform for innovation within the federal government. And hopefully, states are going to want to fork that code and take it. And locals are going to want to fork that code and take it. Uh, we've already had um, uh, Hawaii, Hawaii.gov actually uh, kind of, I don't know if they, I think they forked my USA and they're starting to play around with it, but they're kind of using that same concept whether or not they use the actual code or not. But, um, you know, we're building, we're hoping that it, it, uh, it helps agencies build these new effective tools to engage with the public. Um, so my USA is kind of a, uh, a single sign-on platform. So an agency can come and say, I want to build on top of my USA, like you would build an app for Facebook or like you would build an app for Twitter. Then you log in with my USA and you can interact and, and do your business at benefits.gov or do your business at Business USA. But then things, they're able to do things that they weren't able to do before, like persist certain information or certain tasks or bookmarks or profile information to your my USA profile. So uh, that's a little bit about my USA. Um, and as I said, we're, we're kind of rolling that out a, on a slow boil. Uh, we've got a few customers. We're kind of on a tipping point in terms of uh, rolling it out to, to those uh, few agency customers first, and then it'll eventually go public over the next few months. But um, 
I, I want to just come back to that, that notion of innovation within government and civic innovation. And I was, I was, I can't remember which was agree and disagree, but I was, I was definitely leaning toward disagree in terms of needing government for civic innovation. I don't think you do. But I also just want to keep hammering home the fact that it is happening inside. And that fellowships like mine and like CFA, what, what they really are doing is, is uh, kind of just really getting people who are the, the career people there excited and un you know, understanding that they can kind of keep this stuff going. Um, so I guess the bottom line for me is uh, the thing I've been doing for 15 years is changing the way that people interact with the government. And to me, that is the foundation of civic innovation. Thank you, Hillary. Well, Earlier today, when uh, people were talking about you know whether technology is necessary for civic innovation, I kind of felt like how could it not be? But at the same time, um, you know, a lot of what the esteemed panelists here have been talking about is how policy folks are kind of like the uh, the impetus for that change in the very beginning. And some of the stories that uh, that I want to share with you today about the Code for America Brigade. Um, of which I'm a co-captain for the Code for America Brigade in Northern Virginia. Uh, it's kind of a lot of the more successful projects that we've had stemmed from passionate policy folks with an idea that kind of took it forward with a uh, tech platform. And when I think of um, kind of how the brigade fits in with civic tech innovation, the big picture, the big ecosystem, I like I like this uh, concept that was brought forth by Clay Shirky called cognitive surplus. And um, why I like this term so much is, and I didn't hear about it actually until I was a Code for America fellow, um, our executive director, Jen Palka, really follows um, Clay Shirky's ideas and, and loves the concept of cognitive surplus. And that is basically that um, people are going to have some free time eventually, and what brings about this free time and their schedule. <laughs> well, okay, they, they, get free they get free time because of efficiencies that are built in. And, and I think that uh, technology has afforded this collaboration, this kind of like efficiency to collaborate online. And to some extent, that's also maybe made uh, some of our thinking through collaboration more efficient, freeing up more of our time, making us more productive, maybe uh, more efficient, more productive. So. Um, you know, if you have if you have a interest in volunteering in your community to begin with, um, how, and you have technical skills, how would you necessarily best use that? Well, here comes the web. Here comes the te here comes the internet. All of a sudden, now people, even before there was uh, Gov 2.0, you know, were learning how to share files, learning how to collaborate. You know, just using the internet. This is a great tool. Well, now the web, the web and the internet provides technicians a way, technical folks, coders, a way to collaborate with policy folks and understand a little bit more about their world and see that they can make a difference through their, through their, uh, through their coding efforts. And um, you know, at a basic level, we develop technology to streamline and enhance citizen engage engagement with government. Um, we currently work with Arlington County and Alexandria on different types of projects, and I want to share a couple stories in that vein. Um, in particular, it, one of the very exciting projects that we had was the Alexandria Community Indicators Project, which was started by uh, Randy Russo, who's in the audience. And um, he used to work for the, the um, Urban Institute also, and had an interest in community indicators. And as it turns out, <laughs> Um, there just wasn't a whole lot of data on Alexandria community indicators specifically. And so he took this as a project. He heard that there was a technical, there was a brigade in Northern Virginia. There were some interested techies, some coders that, um, you know, wanted to give back to their government, but maybe didn't know, didn't have a project to work on. Just was like, hey, I know, I know CCAN, I know how to set up a data portal, but I don't really, you know, what, what can I do with that? So Randy came along and he had this, this fabulous project, which really, you know, once people started to learn about it, maybe they weren't necessarily policy people beforehand, but once they started to learn about 
what community indicators were. It became more than just a satisfying geek out coding project. It became more of a, I can make a difference. I can actually impact my local community by getting involved in this project, just by being, just by, you know, being a server administrator and setting up a CCAN instance. I can make a change. And, um, and Randy also has an interesting side story here too because he came from the policy side of things, but then um, he was pursuing a master's degree in, in uh, information technology. And so this, this project of the communicators was, uh, rather the um, indicators, was a way for him to kind of develop his technical skills and like the crossover between policy and technical development. So I see, um, I see the brigades the brigade's kind of position within the whole ecosystem of civic technology innovation is being a way for, being kind of also like a way for policy people and technical people to come together. And look, there's skill sharing that goes on. So we can learn about, I can learn about community indicators and their significance and the policy significance of this. And at the same time, um, there is a technical literacy aspect that I think um, goes on as well, where policy people are, are learning more about the power of technology and how they can leverage that to make even more exciting, efficient, empowering applications for citizens. Um, and, that, and that's sort of a focus that, you know, that's a side benefit that we get out of our brigade too, is, is education, you know. So in addition to developing civic tech um, innovation projects, we also provide a platform for people to learn. And um, I'm humbled to be on this panel today because before I started at Code for America, I actually didn't know so much maybe about all of these wonderful projects that go on in our country to help people, to help people save money, low income people save money and all the thought that goes on behind that. And, um, and people really trying to look into their communities and understand what goes on there. And uh, the way that government is trying to be innovative, who knew? You know, I, I was just a lawyer before I, I came to Code for America, and I, I didn't think much of government, but I learned so much that a lot of things are changing. And I think that, that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, civic, civic innovation happens in many different ways. It happens through technologists. It happens through policy people. I feel like, yes, um, to some extent, technology can, civic innovation can save our democracy because it's the next big platform that's allowing for this cognitive surplus to come forth and be very efficient and productive. But you know, in the end, it's always going to be passionate policy people that are going to be bringing forth these ideas that make them a reality, hand in hand, in, in cooperation with, uh, with technical people to make it happen. So, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Michelle. So there's just one more story left, and then we can uh, get to some questions from you guys. Um, I, my name's Ryan Garrity. I work upstairs at the Open Technology Institute with Alyssa. Um, and Alyssa asked me to come speak about um, civic innovation projects that we see in our international work. Um, and I'm going to focus this story on the aspect of civic innovation that's really about communities coming together to redefine uh, models of governance and about self-governance and innovations in self-governance. Um, and the story really addresses one fundamental question, uh, which is if 50 children can come together to plan, a communication, to plan their communications infrastructure with paper markers and pictures of routers. So remember that question. Um, so the story, my story starts uh, in Detroit uh, with a project called the Digital Stewards, um, which OTI, the Open Technology Institute, developed with Allied Media Projects, um, which helps neighborhoods plan, organize, build, maintain, and govern uh, community-owned communications infrastructure. So in that program, these digital stewards learn how to build community wireless networks that link uh, rooftop to rooftop and allow people to share local information on the network, uh, communicate internally between themselves, uh, or share internet access. Um, and the basic premise of that work is that communities should be able to participate in the governance of their infrastructure. 
Now, like generally, that could be around roads, land use, commercial development. But in this case, new technologies make it possible for communities to build communications infrastructure uh, relatively efficiently. Um, so in December, uh, to carry that work forward, I traveled with a team uh, from the Open Technology Institute to a place that I think can really define the intersection between civic innovation and the formation of democracy. Um, and where people are standing up to demand that they be allowed to participate in governance decisions, uh, particularly in telecommunications and internet policy um, in a place that had been extremely repressive in that area. So uh, myself and my team, we traveled three hours south from Tunis to a small town on the Mediterranean coast called Saeda. Now, Saeed is really important in Tunisia because they are uh, at the forefront of civic technology and civic innovation that's happening in Tunisia, uh, particularly at the municipal level. So immediately after Ben Ali stepped down in 2011, civic technologists in this small town uh, decided to start working on open government and open technology uh, issues. Uh, so they published the municipal budget on the town website, they published the council meeting notes, they have a Wikimedia site that allows uh, local people to contribute knowledge about the community, um, they conduct trainings on open source technology, um, and they've really become a model for the rest of Tunisia to follow. Um, and, and it's possible in Sayeda because these civil society groups can work with a municipality that is very encouraging of those efforts. Um, and our local partners, Si Libre, have been uh, the leading members of that effort in Sayeda. Um, and in the summer last year, they formed an organization uh, to cement that work and carry that work into the rest of Tunisia um, to ensure that communities have ac better access to their government and that governments have to be open and transparent. So C Libre came to us <coughs> wanting to build a community-owned wireless network that would serve as a platform for their local content um, and to encourage the kind of civic innovation that they were hoping their open government work would do. Um, and, and really they wanted a network that the entire community could build together and govern together and that would ensure the community had a say in their digital media ecosystem. So together with C Libre, we conducted a four-day workshop in this small town in Tunisia. Um, and the community learned participatory planning methods using a simple visual language that we developed in Detroit. They learned basic uh, wireless networking principles. They made ethernet cables. We climbed on rooftops um, and we installed routers. Um, we, we worked together with a group of small kids, teenagers, adults, non-technical people, technical people, um, people from nearby towns, people from far away towns came, um, and many people wandered by to see what we were doing, listened for five minutes, and then stayed for the rest of the workshop and started identifying new places where we could expand the wireless network. Um, so we really think of this especially that event was really kind of barn raising where people with different skills came together to build something for the common good. There's really the interesting thing about networks and uh, wireless networks is that you really can't build them without community support. So we didn't get the community to participate because it would be fun. We got them to participate because you need rooftops, you need people to go out and find Households that are interested in hosting routers on their roofs, you need sys admins to work on the community server, um, you need people, graphic designers to design portal pages, um, so it really has to be a community effort. Um, and similarly, the municipality in this case uh, was a good partner and they provide bandwidth to the network and access to municipal uh, rooftops. So in the end of the four-day workshop, we had a wireless network with 11 rooftops and a local community server with uh, 
Wikipedia in French and Arabic with a collaborative editing tool with open street maps and a secure chat. Um, so the entire network was about local information and not sharing the internet, which is a really different model than what we're used to. And it's really uh, part of their greater work to encourage civic innovation or civic engagement in a country that has just recently become a democracy. Um, so the four things that I think are really interesting um, and powerful coming out of the work are that this small town is going to have to develop their own methods of governance for this infrastructure. Um, and that's, I think, a task equal to the tasks of many very difficult community organizing projects. Um, and I think their model will become something of their own. Um, the second thing is that there are towns across Tunisia that are really interested in uh, also building their own network. So it's something that we could see transform the telecommunications landscape of the entire country. Um, and then third, you have local developers developing local applications for those networks. Um, so it's really about local innovation to solve local problems that could transform the community media environment there. Um, and then the final thing is that these projects in Tunisia at the moment, like community wireless, community radio, they will transform the regulatory landscape of the country um, for the foreseeable future as they are grandfathered in to new reforms that happen as, um, as the democracy takes shape and new laws are passed. So if we actually step back and think about Tunisia as a country and civic innovation and the concept of civic innovation and democracy, I think Tunisia is a really interesting case because it's a place where people organized and stood up and said that they should have a role in participating in the governance of their country. And that in a way is uh, the first civic innovation of a democracy, that people organize themselves and demand that they participate in governance. Um, and that is something you really see happening there. For the first time, you have civil society groups that can have some impact and can legally operate within the country. And they are thinking about radical new models of participatory democracy. And they are talking about projects that we really wouldn't here in this country talk about. They are talking about a complete reform of the sort of representative democracy that we're used to. And, you know, maybe none of that will happen. Um, it depends how skeptical you are. But the thing that's interesting is how the possibility that it could happen, how that drives people to think of new ideas. Um, so I just will leave you with three images. Uh, of what innovation, civic innovation in Tunisia looks like. One is two teenagers, a brother and a sister, standing on the rooftop of their high school overlooking the sea with a PVC pipe and a router attached to the top trying to connect their school to the cultural center, to the town hall, to all the houses around them. The second picture is of a 12-year-old girl who was sitting with us around a map that everybody had drawn of her own town. And she was gonna place a picture of a router on a location indicating that we should expand the network. And she looked up and looked around at all of the adults uh, sitting around the table and she said, are we really gonna do this or is it, are we just talking about it? And everyone sort of looked at each other and smiled. <laughs> and then the third is of 50 kids sitting around maps that they drew themselves of their own towns thinking about how the community wireless network should be built. Thank you, Ryan. So um, I'm gonna move into a moderated portion of the afternoon and then we'll open it up to Q&A um, to the audience. Let me just get my time here, okay. Um, one of the things I think a lot about at the California Civic Innovation Project is um, how do I take examples or stories that I hear in one city or one country or one town and replicate that 
and scale it? And, and, and how can I do that um, in my capacity? And so I heard a lot of scaling conversations here. You know, what the work that Michelle's doing at the brigade, I think, is a great example of how things can scale with local activists. Um, the example that Ryan just gave of taking something that had been tested and tried out in Detroit and using that in Tunisia. Um, and then, Rachel, you described Save NYC as actually becoming Save USA through different replications in different cities, and then Kathy, the Camden example, um, with some night funding, kind of testing that out. Um, so I guess I'll direct this question to you, Kathy, and open it up for others to, to kind of add in, but um, what does it take to scale or replicate um, civic innovation, and, and are there things that we should watch out for, or are these aha moments um, to look for? I think um, there's obviously a lot of pieces and it can start in different ways. I think that the replication does not happen automatically. And I think that the innovators are not necessarily the people that are the right people to spread the innovation. Um, sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Um, I think for our network, having um, it's actually been really difficult sort of to get the tech part um, replicated across our network, but I think that's changing a lot with brigades and with these places where we can cross fertilize. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there there does need to be more, um, I think funders don't like to, to fund replication. They like mm -hmm. to fund new things. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need storytellers and the media and journalists have a great um, role to play on this about um, about telling the story of what it takes to replicate. What does it take to adapt? Somebody said context matters. like. How you know does the system in Detroit translate to Tunisia or Camden translate to Los Angeles or, and we just need to learn um, more about how to do that process and and really value and recognize the second user and the s third user mm -hmm. and the fourth user in addition to the great entrepreneurs that came up with the idea in the first place. Yep. I'm sure others have mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Does anybody else want to add in? Scaling. Sure. I would just say based on. Uh, our experience working with New York, I mean, something that's really important is, uh, is partnerships and making sure that the stakeholders um, involved in the process um, are able to sort of maintain that buy-in and communicate its value to other people. Uh, is something that was challenging in expanding the Save NYC model to the other cities is um, getting financial service providers uh, to engage actively in that process. Um, it is not attractive for most banks to offer a lot of very low value accounts. Um, this is why there is uh, part of a reason why there's historically a, a very strained relationship between low income households and the formal financial sector. Um, New York was able to negotiate this process um, fairly easily getting other banks uh, to buy into that was harder, but I think part of uh, the pathway was partially um, was partially laid um, by seeing some of the outcomes of the Save NYC trial, seeing that uh, these families were maintaining their bank accounts, they weren't just turning over, seeing that they were building balances. Um, so having that experience reframe, uh, I think, in their minds and potentially uh, others who may um, sort of move into this space in the future, that this could actually be a higher value prospect. This could be something that uh, in the future um, opens the door to more customers, stable customers, higher balance customers. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that we run into occasionally with the brigade projects, because there's a big push for us to reuse other applications that are already deployed in other cities. A lot of times we have uh, questions such as, well, we have different branding in our local locality, you know, or we have different, our data is done differently. So to some extent, um, one of the roadblocks, I think, towards uh, reusability and scalability for local tech projects is, is this um, it's standardization around data. And I, I understand that um, there's efforts to, to do this kind of standardization, especially around um, community indicators. So those kinds of efforts help, I think, mm -hmm. with scalability. But that is definitely one of the big roadblocks that we run into. That's great. Hillary, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think also on the flip side, um, I used to end some of my presentations with a, with a slide that simply said, technology is the easy part. 
-hmm. You know, I, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people in here that can can, can figure out the, you know the, the, a sustainable way to build something with technology. Um, well, we'd like to think there are anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, but you said a word that just always comes back to me, which is stakeholders. And I, and the, the stakeholders I think are the key to sustainability and scalability. And it's it's really finding those 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 right buttons and the right people and the right levers. Yeah, go ahead. I think, I mean, in our work, what it would be easy for people, for the lesson to take away is, oh, people should build a wireless network in their community, which is, I think, the lesson that a lot of towns take away. Um, and I think that's the problem of replication of a lot of these problems, that it's not actually the thing itself you want to replicate, but the process of how you got there that's important. So if you're building a local application, it may be that the process of the community coming together and deciding what their core needs were is the actual transformative part and that the tech you get at the end is not. As our networks, the network is actually a minor outcome, I think, compared to the community coming together and deciding to take on this really difficult mm -hmm. project and that everybody should have a voice in it. What actually came out, it wouldn't actually matter if that was replicated or not. But the process should be replicated. And I've seen the power of that in the fellowship programs. I think, Hillary, your description of the Presidential Innovation Fellow and kind of going rogue um, is, is interesting and, and it describes a lot of what you're talking about, that it's really the process, it's not the output. And so I'm wondering, maybe Hillary and Ryan, if you could describe what tools, for lack of a better word, do you leave behind to help with the sustainability of that? So in a fellowship, right, you're there for a year or six months. And in Tunisia, you're there for a shorter period of time. What sorts of tools do you leave behind? I think you're you're right on in terms of the process, and that at the end of the day, you know, we we like to stay away from as much documentation as possible, but um, you know, and really focus on like building a pilot and getting things out that people can use. But but I do think that 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 process is 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 really the the, the key thing to under to making sure that all of the people that you're working with in your small small circle that are that are inside, at least in my case, inside the government, and wanting to make something sustainable are understanding how how we got to where we are and how we got to the decisions that are being made. Um, I, I think sort of fleshing that out a bit is, is key. I think the way that we are trying to benchmark it in our work is that if community members can train other community members who can train other community members, then we know we've at least left behind a fragment of that process and that's what we focus on. That community technologists or community members can go through a participatory process with the community to figure out what the core needs are and then address those needs. Um, I think just, you know, leaving behind documentation probably wouldn't, wouldn't get us there at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, sort of just going back to the stakeholder comment, I mean, uh, stakeholders we often think of as, the, you know, the people at the end of the day that are on the bottom of the contracts and sign on the line, but, but to me, it's turning the, it's again, it's turning that small cohort of people that you're working with, turning them into the stakeholders and them into the champions that are going to carry it forward to the next round of fellows that might come in or to the next team that's going to carry it on. Because, you know, we, we might come and go or the people kind of working on the code might come and go, but, but if, if that, you know, if that group of stakeholders, and they really are, it's, it's turning the people that are working on it day to day into the champions of the service that you're trying to get, get going. Um, we heard one gentleman during the spectrogram exercise say that um, government was important because it needed to be, civic innovations need to be institutionalized for sustainability or something along those lines. Um, I'm wondering, Michelle, when you, you just, you described working with Arlington? Arlington or, and, and uh, Alexandria. Alexandria. Um, how, how did you guys approach that relationship? And how, so how do civic activists work with government? And, and can you kind of walk us through maybe one example of, of what it took to build that relationship? Um, I think probably, the, you know, we, I have a lot to thank to Tracy Vaselli, who's in the audience. Uh, she, she had been in the community already, um, kind of as, you know, through her nonprofit and like reaching out to government and working in partnership with them. 
And I think a lot of it is just kind of recognizing folks that are already in the community that are already kind of have that dialogue going with government and, um, and trying to um, get a sense of what, what that government is interested in, what, what kinds of projects are going to appeal to them, how you can get their attention, how you can plug in and, and make a difference. Because I think every city has their own kind of needs and wants and um, trying to approach it from that angle. And in fact, one of the projects we have ongoing right now is a playground mapper application. And I guess I personally wouldn't have necessarily thought that a playground uh, mapper application would have been such a, a very desirable project in Alexandria, but it is. And um, so, uh, and these kinds of, um, this kind of information, this kinds of needs and wants that cities have and how to dialogue with them can be found through existing nonprofits already that are inter interfacing with government. And is that a role that your group plays, Kathy? I, I noticed in, um, that you're working with cities on data capture um, and kind of opening up that data. What role does, does the Institute play in that? And, and are you an intermediary or how does that work? So the Urban Institute um, is a, um, we coordinate the network of mm -hmm. the local organizations that are locally run and do some, um, so the, the data warehouses and the relationships are all at the local level. Um, I think um, what you said I think is the right, and we're the local partner of DC at the, at the Urban Institute, so we work with the Washington um, area. I think finding how to be useful to the city agencies in their day-to-day -day life. So we were the first people to geocode the DC um, schools data and see where their kids were um, in relationship to charters and, um, and sort of bringing that, that innovation to them. Um, I think that they're, they really welcome it. And it does sort of shift. Brett Goldstein tells a story about how when they used to um, release data and people would find mistakes in data in Chicago, people would attack them and be like, oh, the data's garbage and um, in a really hostile environment. And once the government started to open things up and be available, it was a little more collaborative. It was like, oh, look, there's mistakes in the data. Well, let's fix them, you know, and, um, and really work to uh, be, have a more constructive, hopefully a two-way relationship um, between the government about what they need, what, they hear, what you hear from the citizens, what, what tools are out there to help them. And eventually it might be that you don't need a map or you need more money for playgrounds. You know, I mean, what's the policy question? What's the resource question when it gets down to it? So, Interesting. Um, so Rachel, we, you talked a bit about Save NYC. Um, and I'm wondering what role, so when I think about the civic innovation ecosystem, um, I describe the people that kind of I've come to recognize as people and a actors and enablers in that ecosystem. And one of them is our think tanks. Um, can you describe the role of New America or think tank in this civic innovation, civic innovation ecosystem? Well, I think a couple of the roles that we were able to play during this collaboration, and this is, I mean, something that a couple other panelists spoke to, spoke to as well, is just sort of embedding an idea, right? I mean, that's something that we do. We think, we see a policy problem, we think of a policy solution, um, but to actually make that is to make that actionable uh, really requires having a relationship with somebody in a position to implement that. So I think having that partnership opportunity with municipalities um, who are uh, maybe less in a position to be, um, to really take just sort of the 30,000 foot look at what's going on within their communities and to sort of construct those individualized solutions uh, is, is a value. Uh, I think something that's also helpful is figuring out ways to leverage their effort and commitment. Uh, and that's a function that I think we were able to play through just sort of our role as a convener uh, among other, uh, other actors within the space. You know, the city of New York um, is not uh, an asset building organization. I mean, this is sort of, uh, they're crossing a threshold into a new area, so being able to connect them with other people who are much more experienced uh, and have sort of thought through um, some of these processes before uh, help reduce some of the risk that they assume when they undertake this kind of endeavor. Uh, and then distilling some of the findings, I think, of, of that work. 
um, into, into policy applications and being able to sort of go back to our original concept and refine it uh, based on what sort of the, the, the lived experience of this program is, uh, is, uh, is another role that we play. And then extending that further, um, I guess what role, when you guys, um, Ryan, were working with this, the residents and civic groups in Tunisia, what was your role in that? Or not your personal role, but think tanks kind of role? Yeah, I mean, I think um, sitting here in D.C., we all face this uh, a problem of not wanting to be people who go and intervene in a place um, which is actually almost the opposite of civic innovation. Um, and I think that makes us all think a lot about the role we should play. And um, I think, you know, the other panelists said this quite well, that, you know, as a think tank or as a research institute, we can convene people together, we can provide um, general resources um, for different community groups to utilize that should be shared. Um, but I think it's really, it is very tricky to work uh, with a community and let them guide the process. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I saw that when I worked um, at Social Compact, which did a lot of neighborhood indicators work, but we were a DC-based organization that would go into other communities. And when we did that once or twice a year, we worked very deeply with the community and let them guide the process. And when we were funded to uh, replicate that across a lot of towns, we, we couldn't do that. And we weren't actually encouraging the community voice um, that had been the driver of the work to begin with. And instead, we were the people going out and doing the work and then leaving behind a report. Um, so Hillary, this, I guess I'll, I'll ask you a question, Hillary, and then one last question, then we'll open it up for the audience and um, Twitter. Um, so in what ways have you seen civic innovation change the way that residents and government are interacting? Um, Maybe through your work or through the yeah. works that your cohort of, fellowship, of fellows have done? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's really a broad spectrum. I mean, my work f sort of with state and local government over the last 15 years has been kind of just changing the fundamental nature of how we think about government and, and interacting with government and being able to do the business of government online. Like I said, you know, being able to go and renew your driver's license online and being able to go and get a hunting license from my mobile app while I'm sitting at the stream fishing. You know, like, uh, I mean, that kind of stuff it really is kind of revolutionary. Um, and, and, I, and I do think that as more and more of those things happen and more and more apps enable us to to take a picture of our check and deposit in our, our bank, we expect government to keep up. And so um, there, are, there, are, there are companies and there are states that are, that are kind of ahead of the game and really working to make sure that government feels the same way, mm -hmm. feels like you're interacting with your bank or with, you know, with, with mint.com you know, or something like that. Um, so I, you know, I think that there have kind of been fundamental changes on that level. And then there's kind of the, the, other, the flip side of it. So we've alluded to it a little bit with open data and standardizing and things like that. I mean, you know, if you think about what um, uh, another uh, uh, group of, of PIFs, I hate that acronym, but we all do, but um, Presidential Innovation Fellows. Um, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> another group of Presidential Innovation Fellows is working on right now. It's called the Green Button. Uh, has anybody heard of the Green Button Initiative? So there's the blue button and the green button, and there's probably more buttons also. But uh, blue button is focused on health data and being able to download your health record so that it's you know you can take it to any doctor and, and any provider and you know have have your health record. Green button is kind of doing the same thing, but for energy data. So uh, as a California resident, uh, I can go to uh, PG&E ostensibly uh, and wade through their website and find my green button data. And then there are lots of services that that some of the fellows are building and that. Uh, other people at hackathons are building. There's actually there was a, an energy hackathon this weekend, um, uh, this past weekend. Um, so th there are lots of things kind of being built on some of those things like open data. So I can go and grab my green button data, and then you know ostensibly be able to to compare it to my neighbors or compare you know and kind of see where my energy you know stacks up. So you know there's there's really a broad spectrum of civic innovation happening <laughs> at the government level. Um, and just a little plug very quickly for the fellowship program. Who has absolutely no idea what I'm talking about when I say Presidential Innovation Fellow? 
Okay, there are a few in the in the room. So um, I was given some talking points, but I do want to just <laughs> I want to talk about it because it's important, and we I are going right to to cut you off. I'm just oh. kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to be uh, the next round of fellows. The, the applications are going to be open over the probably in the next few weeks. Um, but the the Presidential Innovation Fellowship, the PIF program, was created by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, in 2012, and um, Todd Park was really one of the guys that you know it, is is the champion, and he's kind of the godfather of this program. Todd Park and Macon Phillips and a bunch of people helped get it off the ground in 2012. And the idea is that you know they wanted to take uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, people who have started companies, people who are doing really creative and and awesome work in the private sector and bring them into government and pair them with these people that, I, that I've kind of been alluding to that are trying to get things done, that really want to be innovative, that, that have a really cool idea. So to bring people you know, from the private sector into make them federal employees for six to 12 months and say, okay, let's work on this very you know, specific problem and see what we can get done. And that's, that's the fellowship in a nutshell. There were um, five projects the very first year. Uh, my USA was one of them. It, it, we carried over uh, that, that project was also a project this round. There are, I think, 10 projects this year, and there, uh, there are about 40 of us this year. Um, and we work f you know, uh, across the government. We've got their people at Department of Education, uh, Treasury. I work at the GSA. Um, and so uh, we're really just kind of incubating ideas all over the place. And that's, that's kind of the, the, the purpose of the fellowship. But if you go to whitehouse.gov slash innovation fellows, you can read more about the projects and um, also just sign up to get notified when the, the next application round begins. Um, it's going to be exciting. Um, so this will be my last question to the group, and then we'll open it up for a Q and A um, with the audience and Twitter. Um, so, what's needed to continue to spur civic innovation? Um, and and I'll just I'll start with you, Ryan, and go down to to Rachel if you can kind of just talk about what you think is still needed in this space. Um, well, I think about two things. One. Uh, from lessons I learned uh, working in the U.S. and one uh, internationally. Um, I know when I worked um, with municipal data and mostly planning departments, trying to get their data to do new and interesting community projects, um, the worst part is that those are the, the programs, planning departments, that are cut often. And so as we're increasingly asking for more data and different ways to access that data to do all these innovative projects that we think are sort of um, transforming potentially our democracy, the departments that are actually maintaining the data are losing personnel. So I think that's one thing we have to think about. Um, and then the second thing, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about countries where people are defining governance in the absence of a government, um, and the energy that they have around developing alternative forms of governance, um, of rebuilding democracy, I think a lot of that hope and aspiration um, would need to be transferred here, and we need to find some way to transfer that energy here, because it is a very stark difference, and I think we've become um, stagnant in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, one of the important ways to keep civic innovation going locally is to kind of uh, nurture, first of all, nurture the relationships that the local volunteer community has with local government. And also um, have local government uh, feel comfortable, you know, in, nur in that nurturing of relationships, having them feel comfortable working with outside volunteers, working with technologists, um, you know, I guess a common uh, concept a lot of people have is well, let's get all the data open. You know, and sometimes there's a lot of hesitancy by governments to open data. I think that part of that comes from um, just a, a need for relationship building. Because I think at the end of the day, uh, you're always going to have a group of interested citizens that want to contribute their, their time towards their, their local community and improving their local community. And there's really no ulterior motive, usually. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, at the end of the day, if you're coming to a hackathon, you're coming on a Thursday night to go code on something, you're not looking to you know, make your city look bad. You want it to look good. 
So I think to some extent it's communicating that value and communicating that interest and that, that altruism with your local government um, to see how you can partner. How, and sometimes it's baby steps, it's patience. You know, I mean, it, I think it's mm -hmm. gonna take a lot of patience and just being willing to uh, wait it out or just wait the time, whatever it takes, and just kind of move uh, like a dance, you know, one step at a time. And, um, you know, but I think it's gonna happen, honestly. I feel like there's not, I think that the technology platform and through, through these wonderful efforts too, like uh, Hillary's efforts, um, you know, and policy, nonprofit policy makers, you know, you're gonna see that this is gonna continue along anyway. There's a momentum already here. Uh, but nurturing those relationships is definitely gonna be a very important part going forward. I think if I were to sum it up in one word, it's probably sustainability. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that, that play a part in making the things that we're all doing on the policy level, on the technology level, um, sustainable. Um, and so I think that it's, it's, it's twofold. It's one, making sure that the, the technologies can, can progress, can find homes, can keep doing the good work that they're doing, but it's also on a people level. Again, it's coming back to those stakeholders and empowering the people that are trying to get the good work done, uh, you know, giving, them, giving them the power to actually do that and continue the job and continue the work and, and take the message from Save NYC to Save USA and, and you know, figuring out the model that really works. Mm -hmm. um, for sustainability uh, of anything from you know a Code for America project that started in Louisville and you know wants to go you know nationwide to uh, you know something like um, you know I always talk about Utah.gov uh, they've been surprisingly you know <coughs> you don't think of you know kind of like maybe technology or, or you know progressive things in, in Utah but um, Utah.gov, the team there is kind of a perfect storm. They've they've just been ahead of the curve uh, for the last you know several years, maybe a decade now, um, and the the perfect storm there really kind of revolves around people. Again, the technology is the easy part, but they have the talent to to pull it off once they have a good idea. They've got you know management of that team that says we do want to push the envelope. We want to we want to we want to be better than Colorado or whatever it is. Um, but they also the CTO and the CIO, the people you know, e all the way up to the governor, they empower those people to say, that is a great idea, let's make it happen. And so, uh, you know, I think it just kind of comes back to, um, to people. We, I mean, we focus a lot on the power of networks and really just questioning, just going to um, Los Angeles yes, uh, last week and having them complain about all the fragmentation around their data work. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be this way. It's other, look at other places and there's no one answer, but, um, I think networks um, across the country and, and national organizations that have a place in this um, can show other models. And I think uh, networks that cross fertilize between technology and policy folks, I'm thinking about you know, the transparency camp or other places where we can meet each other and, and learn new ideas and new um, language and skills um, are really important. But uh, you know, I'd also like to end on the, the, when you were talking about the citizen relationship that there, there is a, um, there could be a negative side to this if on the focus of technology could just reinforce current power structures that are there. So if the people that have the smartphone can report the problem in their neighborhood and that they have higher expectations and then more resources go to wealthy neighborhoods once again. So mm -hmm. it takes a really deliberate focus to make sure that the benefits are, are going to be um, experienced equally, um, that the voice is equal. What I just read, oh, in the school boundaries in DC, they said that three quarters of the people that attended the focus groups had a graduate degree. So, I mean, that's, that's not all of DC. So, um, <laughs> it's uh, not representative. So, I mean, I think that that just, it just need, needs to be really aware as we think about um, what, what does it mean to have high speed access? What does it mean um, to have a, uh, camera on your phone, and I think some of that digital divide is um, the technology part might be getting better about that piece, but I think the trust in government and the willingness to um, think that it's worthwhile to engage is, is still a really big divide. So it's a trust issue. I think, we, I think we're talking about relationships once again, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
suppose it's, I mean, similar to your first point about networks, I mean, having a strong community of practice and that allows, uh, that allows cities who are looking to address specific times, types of needs to connect with cities who already have. You know, I think New York is uh, unique in the sense that it was very entrepreneurial, you know, and it was also financed by Bloomberg money, and not all cities have Bloomberg money. Um, so a, as a product of their experience, um, they, they found that they were attracting other cities who wanted to uh, start replicating different aspects of that and wanted to figure out how and wanted to figure out how to do it in a much more uh, financially sustainable way. So I think as an outgrowth of that experience, um, New York and San Francisco have teamed up, have teamed up to uh, form uh, the Cities for Financial Empowerment, and which is now has 12 members um, that allows uh, mayors' offices who are committed to meeting uh, the financial needs of their most vulnerable citizens um, to sort of tap into uh, this network of cities who have already. Uh, played out um, d different ways uh, to to embed some of these needs. So I, I think that's uh, that's one example that's allowed um, you know a, sort of a, a democratization of benefits from sort of this isolated this isolated experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you guys all for joining. I'm going to open it up to questions. We have about 15 minutes left, um, and we have Andrew with the microphone. So if you raise your hand, he'll come up to you. Up here with the scarf. Yep, that's, thank you. Um, hi. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, so in my career as a civic innovator, I've been routinely disappointed, or dismayed really, by the lack of, um, commitment or even thought about co the community engagement and organization needed to make projects work. Um, you, a lot of you have alluded in several comments to the importance of community organization um, and community organizing in the civic and innovation process that I just was wondering. I feel like for me it's a really important aspect of it and projects aren't successful without it, but I but I'm sort of interested in, in what you guys have to say about that. Yeah. Um, I think to some degree that question um, does also lead back to this question about uh, equity in the kind of work that we're talking about. Um, and I think you know one thing that's interesting is um, the work that Kathy does and work that I um, have done in the past is that it came out of community organizing around social justice and that the data piece, that like innovative piece that we often talk about um, was a means to an end and you know the, the caution around a lot of this open government, open data work is that because it's not coming from a social justice equity framework um, we are going to have those inequities, and unless you have the social organizing framework, um, you're not going to be able to counterbalance that at all. So I think that is a really good question for everybody. Anybody else want to add? I just I think that um, you know our most of our our organizations are outside of government, and I think there's a reason for that, and they can be a little more vocal about those things that maybe the city government is not always. Um, uh, free to do or have the, the um, so it takes, you know, um, I think there are different pressure points um, to, to do that, but I think, um, I jump in. I mean, I think the, I think our partners have, um, who might have been reluctant about the hackathons to begin with, um, have now decided that it's easier to join the places. And our data, our Detroit partner is now partnering with a tech company about gathering, um, uh, gathering data about vacancy and having they have 120 residents um, mapping out the city now um, so I think I think opting out is not the right answer I think jumping in learning a language figuring out the different perspectives both from the government from the technology folks um, uh, is the answer and it's um, it's it's not a short process I think I went to my first tech like 2010 I went to my first tech meeting and thought I don't belong here, and we're different. <laughs> we're different people, and um, uh, 
But you know, I think that the two worlds are coming together. We're actually learning to do things better. I mean, I, I think, of course, we have a whole panel full of optimists here, um, as you can tell from where we are. But um, yeah, I think that I think we can we can shape how things are um, progressing, coming out in our communities. And it sounds like you you're you are doing that too. So, any other questions? Yeah, up here in the front. Oh. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, how have you been able to bring in the communities by getting their inputs over the internet? Does anybody want to answer? Well, um, on a very basic sort of uh, technology level, if you will, uh, we've had uh, several projects that I've worked on have seen great success from using things like IdeaScale, user voice. Um, the, the, some technologies that just kind of do that for you. Uh, but then it, there comes the hard work of community organizing because you have to get people to those tools. So tools are only part of the answer. Um, but you know, I, I think that uh, if I were to add something to the last comment that plays into this, it's there, there, I think that there is a job description there basically for you know, organizations like Code for America and for companies like NIC. Like they, they really do, they need a community organizer you know, or something like that. You know, a, a, a Catalyst, you know, I don't you give it a cool name, but but I think there is a job description there to kind of ensure that we are getting people to the tools that then get people to the output. And just to add to that, Hillary, I think getting them to the tools at the right time in the process, right. I think, is also really important because oftentimes I've seen in the work that I do in municipal governments in California that the tools are used after the fact, and so we really want to get people seeding the ideas and it based on need. And so if we can insert that process earlier on with tools, whether it be internet tools or face-to-face, -face, um, I think that's important. Questions? Yep, in the back. So I wanted to go back to the community organizing question. And, um, and one of the things that kind of bothers me, I go to a lot of data things, is we always talk about people showing up, but we never talk about going to where people are. So for example, um, Sorry, I'm talking too loud. I'm not used to mics. <laughs> um, I, I did a, a brief thing with Open 311 where I went to community centers. And Can you hold the mic to your, yeah, closer to your, to your mouth. It's Thank echoing you. for me. Though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, I did this project where I went to community centers and to neighborhood centers in D.C. with Open 311 where people had never heard of it, had never done it, and then we did a mapping of their neighborhood. And they thought it was great. They thought there was problems with it, but they thought it was great. Mm -hmm. But... And I'm involved with code for DC, but no one, we always have things at 1776 or at Sunlight Foundation. We don't really go out into communities. And to me, that's reinforcing power dynamics and reinforcing lack of social connections between communities. And so I would like to hear, besides having people show up at our spaces, how we can start going out to people's spaces. Well, I have an example of um, at Code for Oakland, which is a hackathon that's held in Oakland. I think they're in their third year now. Um, the, sec the first year they did some listening sessions and they started doing them and asking people to come to City Hall. That didn't work out. Um, and it was listening sessions with the community because they had realized early on that there was a disconnect between the community need and the technologists that wanted to build really cool stuff. Um, and so the second year, what we did, and it was just, it was an attempt, and I think it can continue to be improved upon, but what we did was create listening sessions and go to public libraries throughout Oakland. And so we held them in different neighborhoods, still a government building um, in a library, but it was meeting people in at least different neighborhoods throughout the city to have those conversations. Um, I've heard of stories, and I, I I don't know the actual organization that was doing it, but I've heard of examples of um, doing outreach while people are waiting in line. And so asking people questions and getting input, kind of getting input into the process while people are waiting on in line for something that they normally would do. But I don't know if there's other examples of kind of meeting the community where they're at. It was a great um, piece of uh, the, when was Code for America in Honolulu? Was that last year? 
2012? 2012, I think. I was a mentor to the Code for America Honolulu team. Um, and one of the things that kind of came out of that was uh, this, I can't remember what they called it, it had a great name, but it was basically like a ride the bus campaign. Yeah. And the mayor of Honolulu rode the bus all around and, and kind of texted and tweeted throughout the day and got feedback and, and just kind of talked to people all over the city. Um, and I, I think things like that can go kind of a, a long way towards towards what you're talking about. But I also think kind of in the work that I do to step back and maybe not speak specifically about civic innovation, but, but there is a lot of, um, and I always kind of think of user testing and trying to get out to people uh, kind of where they are and in the communities that they are and you know focus groups or user testing or you know standing on the corner and having them look at a, at a wireframe for a prototype something like that I mean even little examples like that are, are a good way to just kind of get get it in front of people that you wouldn't normally uh, get it in front of people uh, I mean one thing that we've talked about recently in the office a lot is that we actually don't necessarily want to be training people to build communications infrastructure that we actually want to um, we actually want individuals in the community sort of civic technologists to act more like labor organizers in the US act and that they go to a community and ask what the community needs and it might be a tech thing and it might not be a tech thing um, and address those needs as you would if you were an organizer. But you know, so often because of how we're funded or what our specialty is, even if you are going to the neighborhood, you're still going with your solution. Um, so for us, it really means uh, creating uh, community organizers in places and letting them figure out what the needs are in their own in their own places. Well, yeah, I think. I mean, if. Um, and I've, I've actually heard um, very unhappy stories on all sides about developers even going into the neighborhood and saying, how can 311 solve your problems? You know, and a kid was shot last night or something, and they're um, terrible schools, violent um, crime, and 311 is not solving their problems. So, I mean, I think it's the listening. Um, so you have, I think you're right, you have to go to them both physically and, um, um, and actually in practice, yeah, to actually listen and be open to what's, um, to what's needed, and there's, I think there's a lot of e examples, and um, we have a story in, on our website about Pittsburgh, and it was a promise neighborhood focus that was focused around kids, and that was the funding was around kids, but the parents were worried about vacant housing because it, the, it was, the kids had to walk past the vacant housing and the um, squatters and the drug, drug use and unsafe buildings to get to school, so you had to rearrange things and be like, oh, okay, it's, a, it's not a kids program, it's about housing, which is about kids, and so I think, yeah, it's, um, it's both uh, yeah, mentally and physically um, going to where people are is where we're going to get the most traction and hopefully community change. Did you want to ask me? Yeah. I feel like it's also very important for um, like brigade groups, um, such as uh, Code for Northern Virginia, to, again, like, I guess, uh, nurture relationships with nonprofits that have, uh, have outreach already in the community and already understand these needs, because a lot of times, you know, um, we may be, you know, developing an application that just serves a particular, you know, demographic and, and, but yet that's never the intent, okay, you know, so it's like, to the extent that we nurture relationships with other nonprofits and that we understand, we get a better sense, a better, broader, high level picture of what's going on amongst um, needy communities, um, that that's a better way, I think, that we can really make sure to be more inclusive. I would say, though, honestly, like, I guess probably our perspective is anybody is always welcome to come to our meeting. You know, like we try to be welcoming and friendly, but I, I can see how it would be both an effort and also um, scary for some people to just walk into a room of coders and be like, hey, I want you guys to do this. You know, so I think, um, you know, it's just a matter of kind of trying to build those relationships with, with other nonprofits. And, it, and it'll happen. I, I'm optimistic <laughs> that it'll happen, and events like these bring bring the techies and the policy people with the real boots on the ground knowledge together. So, any other questions? Well, you know, combining a couple of of things that you've both said. Uh, the, people have said, well, in Tunisia, you were talking mostly. Well, some of the pictures you were raising were kids. And you were and and Michelle, you were just saying how, you know, it's scary to walk into a a, a room full of coders, uh, but you know, twelve-year-olds are 
too small to fail? You know, what's being done to reach out to, you know, to, to find ways to engage kids here? I mean, you know, meeting on a Thursday night at NSF, eh, especially if, you know, there's no, no food, no, you know, I think um, you know pretty much. Um, again, it'll it'll be just kind of like it, it's an evolution. You know, our our hacker groups, our civic hacker groups, have just started. You know, a couple of years ago, and we're still still trying to learn our way. And um, w we are very altruistic geeks. You know, we we want to help kids. We want to help everybody um, as much as possible. And I think, w you know. By interacting with other nonprofits and by interacting with activated citizens, um, eventually I hope that we will get to to help everyone and or at least learn more about those opportunities, see what's out there. And you know, you're going to have uh, community college professors and professors and high school teachers that will find these opportunities and and try to get their students involved and try to there there will be an evolution in what we're doing. It may not happen overnight. But I think it is in the back of everybody's mind that we want that to happen. And I would argue that it, it is happening. I don't know if it's specific to the 12-year-old set or not. But it definitely, you know, under college and high school, and uh, they, they are, you know, starting to get engaged and starting to show up at events and starting to go to hackathons. And there are even fellowships targeted toward, toward kids. Um, and I, I think that the, all of the models that have been explored here today, whether it's a Code for America Brigade or a hackathon or a fellowship, you know, th I think there is an understanding that there is the next generation that d just totally gets it and wants you know to be boots on the ground as you said from the get-go and the image that I used for the invite um, was the girls make the city out of the city of Boston so it was a really great program where the city of Boston went around to different schools and engaged um, kids in making things for their city so it was a maker project um, and it was a really successful project so I'm going to um, wrap up the event now. It's six o'clock and we're actually ending on time. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, you have our Twitter handles and I hope that we can stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>